All right, good morning, everyone. We'll go and get uh, started. So my name is Brian Hughes. I am a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. You can find me everywhere online on Twitter and GitHub and whatnot at uh, Nebrius. Now I'm trying something a little bit new for this talk. I've actually created a landing page for this talk that has uh, like all resources, links, and things like that there. So that way you're not having to like write stuff down throughout the talk. And you can see that link here on this slide, and it's also going to be on uh, basically all the other slides after that. So if you want to check out more, you can check it out there. And so today, we're going to talk about effective agile processes. So I've been doing the software engineering thing for a while now. I actually started coding uh, 20 years ago this fall. So I've, I've been around, let's just say. And I've worked at a number of companies over the years, a handful of startups in the Bay Area, as well as a larger company there. And then now I'm at Microsoft, which is an enormous company. And so I've seen probably at least a dozen different variants of agile that I've worked on. And then on my most recent team at Microsoft, I was actually tasked with coming up a new agile process for that team, given that we had some kind of unique constraints that changed how you normally do things. So you know, I've uh, just seen a whole bunch of different agile, and something I'm actually pretty passionate about, even though I realize I don't talk about it much online. But I think it's really important. And like one of the things that I, I've learned over you know, these many years doing this is that the specific process you use isn't actually all that important. You know, there's a whole bunch of different types of Agile out there, all with their pros and cons, but almost any of them can be made to work. And what really determines whether or not uh, an Agile process is effective isn't so much like the steps that you're following, but more the mindsets and the values that you bring to it. So we're gonna kind of go through a bunch of that today. Uh, but first, you know, what is Agile? You know, hopefully this is something that most of you are at least somewhat familiar with, but we'll go over a few definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page. And so I like, here's how I like to define Agile myself. I like to say that Agile is a set of practices and structures for how engineering teams organize their work to deliver products. Now there's a couple of implications in this definition that I really want to point out. So the first is that it's a set of practices and structures for engineering teams to organize their work. So the idea is you know, when we're working on a project, there's a bunch of work that has to be done. You know, a lot of this is in the form of coding, but there's also like design work, testing, validation. You know, this is a bunch of work that needs to be done to accomplish this. Agile doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the work itself. Like Agile doesn't tell you how to code. It's more a set of practices that sort of sit on top of the coding that help us to organize that and to give it some structure so that we're not just kind of going out and cowboy coding and being like, oh, we'll get this done sometime. You know, it's a way of organizing this work that we're already doing. And the other implication is that we're organizing this work specifically to deliver products. And so at the end of the day, Agile is all about delivering. It's all about accomplishing and getting things done and getting our products in the hands of customers and users. Uh, so this is something that you, know, you wouldn't really see Agile in, say, a research Institute. You know, they're going to need different kinds of processes that maybe isn't quite so focused on delivering. But so like, this is kind of like how I like to define it. And most Agile systems, there's a couple of core steps that they have in common. Uh, there's a bunch of others that vary from, you know, say, Scrum to Extreme Programming to Kanban and others. But they all kind of have these basic parts. And so in Agile, all of the work we do is organized into user stories and tasks. Sometimes these have different names. You might hear user stories called epics. You might hear tasks called issues. But they're all the basic same concept. The idea is that there is some very high level thing that describes you know, a large portion of work that we're going to do in a very abstract way. So this is, for example, if you're, say, creating a music streaming company and a music streaming product. I used to work at RDL, so I like this example a lot. Uh, and then a user story could be something like, we want to implement player control so the user can control their music, right? Super high level, no real implementation details. Uh, and then we have tasks or issues. And this is where we take you know, this really high level big thing and we break it out into really small discrete chunks. Something that will take an engineer you know, at most about two days to complete, ideally even shorter than that. So we're taking you know, high level abstract and breaking down it into tiny concrete details. So once we have these units of work, then we sort of organize that and we figure out what we're going to work on when. And we do this through the basic unit called a sprint. And so a sprint is just you know, a unit of time, some fixed unit of time that's usually pretty short in duration. On average, about two weeks. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. But it's usually it's on the measure of weeks, not months or years. And so we have this period of work. And, we, or, and during this period, we're going to do a bunch of tasks and work and have something to show for it at the end. We're going to have something we can deliver. 
Uh, and so whenever we have this unit of time, we break that into basically three components. There's the planning period at the very beginning. Then there's the bulk of the sprint, which is dedicated to actually you know, writing code, doing designs, doing testing, and things like that. And then we have a retrospective at the end. And so during the sprint planning, it's basically figuring out what tasks are we going to do or are we going to commit to doing in this two-week period. Then we actually do the work. And then while we're doing the work, there are very regular meetings called a stand-up. Usually these are every day or every other day. And so in a stand-up, the idea is you say everything you've worked on since the previous stand-up and what you're going to work on uh, before the next stand-up. And also this is where you surface any kind of like, issues, uh, if you run into any bugs, challenges, things like that. And it's just a really good way for the team to kind of sync up and make sure everyone's on the same page. And then at the very end of the sprint, we do a retrospective to say like what worked well and what could be improved upon. And if you're doing like Scrum or things like that, there's a bunch of pieces on top, same thing with others, but they all have these basic components. Uh, and so we're just gonna kind of focus on this uh, a little bit. But you know, like I said though, the specific steps aren't all that uh, important in determining success, in my opinion. Because one of the things about Agile is it's called Agile because it's constantly changing. Like a good Agile process changes itself over the lifetime of a, of a project. So it's, I think it's better to understand a set of core values. And if you can really remember these values, uh, then that kind of helps with whatever in, uh, Agile system you're working on. And it can help you to remain consistent as your Agile process itself is changing, which is pretty common. And so these values aren't necessarily things I came up myself. Well, but I've sort of formalized the ones I'm about to show you for the work I did at Microsoft and my previous team. But a lot of them come from like the Agile Manifesto, uh, which is a you know, document that was written about 20 years ago now that really outlines a lot of the modern values we see in modern Agile, as well as just based on experience. So the first value that I want to talk about is that we deliver good software to customers. So this is you know, essentially a rehash of the definition we saw earlier, and you're probably thinking like, oh, well, duh, that seems kind of obvious and straightforward, right? But there actually are a couple implications that I want to highlight in this. Like the, I chose the wording very carefully in this, and I say that we deliver good software to customers. Notice I did not say excellent or perfect or anything else like that. You know, whenever we're creating software, we have constant like, challenges and contentions that we have to deal with and conflicts. And you know, we never have enough time, we never have enough resources uh, to create this exactly the way we want. Like creating perfect software is actually something of a problem whenever we're creating products for customers. Because creating perfect software takes an inordinate amount of time. You know, this is kind of where they're saying, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good come into play. You know, we want to figure out, you know, we want to write good quality software. We, of course, we always do. But we have to balance that with actually getting software in the hands of users, because until we can actually get software out there, we can't get feedback on it on Iterate. So this is you know, this kind of interesting balancing act that we want to make sure that our software is good enough that we don't go overboard on trying to make it too perfect. And the other thing that I would just want to highlight is you know, this is all about delivering software to customers. At the end of the day, what matters is you know, our customers and users. Like, are, is the software working for them? Is it helping them? You know, when we're writing our software, we're not writing it you know, as an academic exercise just to write you know, the coolest code ever. As much fun as that is, and as much as I love coding, that's not really the point of most engineering. It's not to write that perfect algorithm. It's to get something that people can actually use. And so we want to make sure that we're really balancing all these needs out, and we're not getting overly focused on any one of these. You know, uh, because that's, if we're staying really well balanced in terms of like quality, but also getting stuff out there in the hands of users and iterating quickly and all of that, that's usually whenever we end up doing the best. So the next value is that we are collaborative. You know, whenever we're working on this, you know, there's usually a bunch of different groups involved. You know, there's going to be a front-end team that could be one or more back-end teams. You might have an Android team, an iOS team. Then you have design teams, QA teams, support, sales, marketing. There's a whole bunch of different groups that all have to come together to make a product successful. You know, if we actually want to get you know, users using our product and you know, paying for subscriptions or at least you know, viewing ads and things like that, you know, the things that we have to do in order for a company to succeed, we've got to get stuff out there that works for them. Now the thing is, is what goes into that is actually multifaceted. It's not just about code. Like you can write the greatest code in the world, and it may not mean anything if you don't have people to actually get it out there and get it out to the hands of users. Like if you write the greatest code in the world but no one can find it, it might as well not exist. So like sales and marketing are really important. But also, you know, like I said, we want to make good enough software. We want to make sure it's a good enough quality that you know, it's not annoying and frustrating to use. 
And so this is where you know, QA departments are really important. Same thing with design. You know, and we often like to, and I've seen an unfortunate habit where a lot of these teams kind of have a bit of a, a combative relationship. You know, I've definitely seen this between like sales and engineering, sales over promising, engineering under delivery. I've seen this between design and front end. You know, design wants to create this great UI and then the front end team pushes back saying like, well, this is really hard, you know, I don't want to do this. And like, it's good to push back. Like, we, we have these teams to serve as, a che as checks and balances on each other, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in a collaborative way and that we understand that we're all trying to see the, achieve the same goal. And we need to realize that you know, when another group is pushing back on us, you know, they have a different perspective than we do, and that perspective is really valuable. And of course, vice versa. You know, in, a, in the best teams, you know, we're all really working as one team. We don't view ourselves as these siloed entities that don't get along. Now the next value is that we are all individuals. And I realize this sounds a little contradictory to the previous value, but uh, hear me out, I have a point here. So like, w whenever we're working on these teams, we're all a bunch of human beings. Like, you know, human beings create software at the end of the day. And you know, we are human, we have emotions, we have logical fallacies, we have biases, irrationalities, we have you know, limited information, and we tend to act like that. And we all have different ways of doing our best work. You know, we have different communication styles. We like to work at different times of the day. So like the classic you know, easy example I like to throw out there is you know, morning people and night people. Like for me, I can't really start doing good work until about 10 a.m., which I realize is before 10 a.m. right now, and I am feeling pretty tired, by the way. Uh, but like I start to do my best coding work, especially in the afternoon, sometimes even in the evenings. But then I know people who are the exact opposite. They get some of their best coding work done before 9 a.m. And so if you really want your team to succeed, you have to realize that everyone works just a little bit differently. And you want to try and accommodate that as much as possible. So like, especially if you're a manager, you know, think about like when you're scheduling your meetings and make sure that it's convenient for everyone. And then you're not forcing everyone to be on the same schedule. Now, of course, this is just one example. There's a whole bunch of others. You know, communication style is absolutely one of these as well. Uh, working in an office versus working at home. You know, different people have different ways of doing their best work. And if you really want the team to be effective, you want to try and enable that as much as possible. Instead of trying to create you know, this one type of developer, this one type of de uh, designer. Because there is no best way to work, but there is a best way for each individual. So the next value is that we trust our teammates. Again, this is one that kind of sounds obvious on the surface, but it's something that in practice we tend to really struggle with. You know, if we're working on a team, we're there for a reason. You know, we were hired for a reason. Uh, everyone that's working on our team has talent. Uh, and whenever someone is struggling on a team, most of the time that's not because they're just an objectively bad developer. That's actually pretty rare. Usually there's something about the conditions of the team that makes it so that person can't thrive. So we need to remember that you know, we know what we're doing. You know, developers, are, we're all pretty experienced, you know, at least good enough to do the jobs that we're doing. You know, most development work is, you know, I hate to say it, sorry, but we're not sending rockets to the moon. You know, we're oftentimes we're creating web pages, which is a challenge, but it's not on the same level as some stuff, uh, of a lot of things. So you, you just need to be experienced and good enough, and most developers are. And so we need to trust that people ultimately kind of know what they're talking about. Now there is a corollary to this, is that sometimes we run into stuff where we don't know what we're doing. Like there's a, you know, I've been coding for a long time, like I said, two decades, and there's a whole bunch of shit that I do not know. And, and I still run into things where I'm trying to solve something, I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. And so whenever we get stuck, you know, the corollary to this is that we need to ask for help. You know, whenever we're stuck on something, it, I know we all have this urge to kind of hide it, try and fix it ourselves, because we don't want to look, you know, like an idiot or something. But the thing is, we all get stuck. There is always something that we don't know. And so whenever we get stuck on something, we should basically just kind of get over that you know, feeling that we want to project we know everything and just ask for help. Be like, hey, I'm stuck on this. Can you help me? And if we work, the best teams are ones where people are not afraid to ask for help. And then and on the flip side, people trust that when they're doing something, they know what they're doing. So for another example of how this can play out is let's say on a pull request. So someone you know, submits a pull request and you see something where you're like, that your initial instinct is, well, we could do this a lot simpler this other way. Uh, there's a lot of ways to respond to this. You could say, you know, this is stupid, you should do it this way, it'll be much faster or better. This is not how you want to do it. But what I always like to do is just ask a question of like, you know, uh, why did you do it this way? You know, is it possible to simplify this, something like that? 
Because you know, sometimes the answer is, yeah, that person dismissed it. But sometimes there's also, and I found more often the case, is that there is some weird edge case. So there's something about the problem that the reviewer missed. Uh, and, just, and this is a good chance to create that dialogue. And so you want to trust that people, know what, uh, that people know what they're doing, but also that we make mistakes. So you just want to be open and honest about where we're at. And if you can do that, then that generally makes you know, pull requests go faster. It makes collaboration go faster. Like it makes everyone more efficient and allows us to get more work done. And by the way, uh, on the flip side of this is like having to constantly second guess your teammates, being like, oh, are they really getting this? It's kind of exhausting, because then you're having to worry about your work and theirs, and that's no fun. So let's just not do that. The next one is we are agile. Okay, this is very circular reasoning, I realize, but this is one of those cases where agile was perfectly named, I think. Like agile processes is the perfect name for how this works. Because like, the thing about software engineering is that it is kind of inherently unpredictable. Uh, there is no way to really predict how everything's going to go in software. Like, there are lots of unknowns uh, and lots of ambiguity that we're always going to encounter. You know, bugs happen. We write bugs. Sometimes we're using a library, and it turns out there's a show-stopping bug in this library that prevents us from getting our work done. You know, we miss deadlines. We just we make mistakes. Like, this is part of the engineering process, and it's going to happen. There's no way to eliminate it. Like we want to try and reduce it as much as we can, and this is what Agile is about, is about reducing some of the mistakes we make, but it also understands that there's some things we just cannot you know, get rid of through process. And so you really want to embrace that. You want to embrace that you know, unexpected things are gonna happen. You know, you're going to encounter that case where you were working with the design team and you both thought you had a mutual understanding of what this design was, turns out you didn't. You know, halfway through, and then all of a sudden you have to rework a design. Like this stuff just happens. And so you want to expect that. You know, there's the famous saying that uh, a couple millennia old now that's just expect the unexpected. Uh, as mentioned by a Greek philosopher, by the way. The whole quote is really fascinating. You should read it. But like, we really want to go into Agile with this philosophy sort of embedded in our heads that we don't know everything that's going to happen, and we should expect that unexpected things will happen and actually plan for that at least plan for it to the extent we can. You know, this is where you have like buffer periods uh, whenever you're figuring out how much work can I do in a sprint. You, know, you don't want to schedule out 100% of your time. You, know, you always do 80 to 90%, something like that. And then whenever things happen and you have to pivot, just accept and roll with it you know, because that happens. Instead of you know, grumbling being like, oh, but that wasn't the plan. We want to stick to this thing because the, this was the plan. Sometimes we just have to throw plans out. Like that happens. And there's another content, uh, or comment that I like to uh, kind of throw out, which is originally written uh, for military by a German admiral many centuries ago called No Battle Plan Survives Contact with the Enemy. It's of course been rewritten recently to say No Business Plan Survives Contact with Customers. Uh, and, and this is really true. You know, we can come up with the best plans of what we're going to deliver. We can think we have like the best you know, new UI that our users are going to love. And then we get it out there and we realize that okay, maybe it's not the greatest thing ever. Or maybe there's certain parts of it that we thought would work and didn't. Like, this is just part of software. And so we want to expect that these things are going to happen and even plan for that and embrace when they're going to happen. Because if we can do that, you know, we tend to ironically have a lot less surprises. Uh, and this is how we actually have a more manageable, like, work-life balance, you know, predictability. This is how we aren't having engineers work 60 to 80 hours a week all the time, which leads to burnout and all kinds of other things. Like This is how we do more sustainable software, is by knowing that we don't know everything. You know, Agile at the end of the day is about embracing change, chaos, and ambiguity. It's not about eliminating them. And the next value is that we put people first. And this actually comes directly from uh, one of the Agile Manifesto values. You know, at the end of the day, process is here to help us. It, it's a guide for us to organize our work. But the process is not the end-all, be-all. The people doing the work are. And so we will often get into these cases where something just isn't quite working about the way our process is. And there's a reaction a lot of times to tell people, like, OK, this isn't working. You just need to follow these rules better, and then it'll be better. But sometimes that's just not the case. Sometimes people just don't work that way. You know, going back to that earlier value is we all work in the ways that we work. And if the process isn't working for us, then the process is what needs to change, not the people. And there's a couple other implications of this as well, is that you know, like, software is all about people at the end of the day. Software is written by people for people. 
And so we should kind of keep this in mind, you know, especially when we start thinking about like customers and users. Like customers and users are people too. You know, it's easy to forget that sometimes, uh, but they are. And so we need to think that you know everyone has, you know, hum we're all human beings. Once again, we're irrational. We have you know emotions that sometimes don't I exactly make sense in the context. But this is part of being human. We shouldn't try to eliminate this. In some ways, we should even embrace this. You're remembering that our customers are human, so whenever they're experiencing issues with our products, they're not going to go in at their best of times being like, oh, thank you for creating this product. I think I, create, I found this like, slight issue. No, they're going to be angry and pissed off, right? And so like, that's OK. And we just need to learn to really work with that and like, understand the pain behind the emotion, so to speak. And just, yeah, changing process is where we should go when things aren't working. Because at the end of the day, we're not cogs in the machine. Like human beings, we don't work well being cogs in a machine most of the time. And like the best processes understand this and kind of embrace that. And I think the last value that kind of comes from the previous one is that we embrace creativity. Like being creative in software is a really good way to be effective at it. Like software is kind of a creative endeavor at the end of the day. You know, it may not be creative in the classic way we think of creativity, uh, like you know, painting or photography or things like that, but it is absolutely still creative. You know, we're solving a problem in which there can be literally millions of possible answers. And when faced with this, there's no way to like, do a mathematical proof to find the best, absolute best code. It's not like there's one way of doing things. There's a whole bunch of different ways of solving every problem. And because there's so many possible solutions, there's no way of knowing all of them, and there's no way of evaluating all of them. You know, we have to use intuition uh, a lot of the times. Uh, and we're going to encounter things that we've never quite seen before. There can be unique combinations of problems that go into you know, optimizing a website or maybe making a form submit. Sometimes we, you know, there are enough unique variables that you know, we can't just search on Stack Overflow and get an answer for it. And the same is true not just in coding, but of process itself. You know, the actual day-to-day -day of creating software, we, there's lots of different challenges that come in. And a lot of times, Agile is, the process you're using will not have an answer of how you do something. You know, maybe there's a unique customer constraint that has some timing that doesn't quite fit into a sprint model, you know, for example, or something like that. So when you encounter these situations where the process doesn't quite tell you what you need to be doing exactly, this is where you get creative. This is where you come up with something, just you know, come up with ideas, brainstorms. It may work, it may not. And it's okay, because again, failure is a part of software development. This is not true, uh, true not just of coding, but of the process itself. So when you're stuck with not knowing how to do something within the process, don't think, oh my gosh, we're missing this piece in the process, we need to change the process. No, just come up with something. You know, get creative, and don't be afraid to get creative, and don't be afraid to take risks. Because taking risks is such a key part of software development and of our industry. You know, if we never take risks, that's a really great way to ensure that the best we do is mediocre. Like, you can never do better than mediocre if you don't take risks. Uh, and so don't be afraid to take risks with your process. If you're like, well, okay, you know, doing Monday through Friday sprints isn't working, think, well, okay, what if we started on a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Or maybe, you know, you have a different work week or, Maybe you know, the normal best practice of like your task should take no longer than two days. Maybe that doesn't work for what you're doing, so just change it. You know, try it. See what happens. Experiment. And like, if you can do this with your process, that tends to help the process work more for you. And it, it helps to get sort of past the, pro the process a little bit and focus on what you're trying to solve instead of trying to think about what are the rules. And this is something that startups are typically pretty good at. You know, it's a bit more of a struggle in the enterprise world. That's you know, one of those areas where the stereotype does kind of hold true. But I think that if we can really follow all of these values, that's whenever you know, we just start clicking better as a team. We start working faster. There, there's less time spent working through issues. Like, you know, this is what a good team feels like. It, just, it feels like everything clicks. It feels like you're not having to constantly stumble over process or stumble over working with another team. Uh, like if you can really just all work together and get on the same page like this, which comes from a position of supporting each other, that's how we create much better software. So next I want to go into just a series of tips. And these are a couple that I found, in my experience at least, are what people tend to get the most hung up on. Uh, and here's a couple of solutions to how you solve that. And so the first one has to do with user stories and tasks themselves. 
So one problem that uh, I see come up quite a bit, especially in the startup world, is that teams are constantly overloaded with work. There's just, you know, you, you think that everything's gonna fit, you know, you do all your task estimates and stuff like that, or well, someone does your task, uh, task estimates, and then you get into the sprint and you realize that, well, every single sprint, you're actually having to put in 110, 120% work just to meet your deadlines. And this happens over and over, and that ultimately leads to burnout. I've actually been on teams where this happened before. And one of the, a really good way that I have found, um, we did this at, on a, my first team at Microsoft, it worked really well, is how you define your user stories and tasks, and more specifically, who does them. So what we found works really well is if you make two requirements. The first requirement is that the only person who can create a user story is a project manager. You make it so that developers are not, and designers are not allowed to create user stories. You can certainly go and talk to a PM and say like, hey, I think we can do this, you can have that conversation. But at the end of the day, the PM needs to be the one who actually creates it. You can almost think of it like uh, a PR for code, for any open source project. Now you have your maintainers that have to sign off on PRs. You know, there's only certain people allowed to do that. So make the requirement that PMs are the only ones allowed to create user stories. But then you balance this very specifically with another requirement that says that tasks can only be created by developers. You say that PMs are not allowed to file tasks and developers are not allowed to file user stories. And you actually get a really nice kind of natural checks and balances out of this. You know, developers are the ones ultimately who know the code base in depth and you, you can figure out how long something will take to accomplish. And this also helps because you can get the developer who will actually be working on this to come up with that estimate because different developers take different amounts of time to solve problems. You know, a senior developer who's been working in the code base for four years is gonna be able to solve something a lot faster than a junior developer who's only been on the team for two months, right? And that's expected. And so you want to keep, again, this human element in, when it comes to like, coming up with like, task estimates and things like that. You know, don't forget that different people are gonna work at different rates. And so you wanna have this kind of checks and balances in place, and if you do that, that's a really good way to make sure that you're prioritizing the right work and also that you're doing the right amount of work. So the next step uh, that I found that worked really well, my previous team also did this and it was, I loved this. Don't do a single sprint planning session, split it into two. So what you do in the first one, this would be say Monday morning, you know, the first meeting you have uh, of the week that's the start of your sprint. You kind of get together, the PM leads uh, the sprint planning meeting and you, know, you figure out who's gonna be doing what. And this is usually figuring out who's gonna be doing what user story you're working at that level. And you kind of assign a user story to one or two developers to go kind of figure out, break down into tasks, and come up with your actual task estimates. And so you, you kind of have this meeting, you figure out who's gonna look at what, you take a break, you know, and then maybe over lunch, things like that, you, know, you go through and you do this sort of decomposition into tasks. And then you come up with essentially like a proposal for who's gonna work on what tasks. And then you'll come, all come back together for a second meeting, and then you actually do, it's kind of like a reconciliation meeting. You look at, all right, how many tasks do we have assigned to the sprint? Uh, how much time is it gonna take? You know, what are your time estimates on the tasks? And how much does that match how much time we actually have? And what we found uh, whenever we did this process is that we're usually pretty close, but we're off by, you know, sometimes upwards of 15, 20%, you know, being either 15, 20% overloaded or underloaded. You know, we come into the second meeting, once we had figured out these details and say like, oh, well, actually, it's not gonna take as long as we thought. We can bring in a little bit more work. Or conversely, that, oh, this, this one part especially is gonna be a little harder than we thought. We need to push some work out. And so by having these two meetings, you can figure this out at the beginning of the sprint, and you're also getting all the right stakeholders involved to make sure that you're bringing in the right work or pushing out the right work. And this is a really effective technique we've found for helping to avoid burnout uh, and making sure that you always uh, are working in a very sustainable way, that your load is sustainable. All right, the next uh, tip, and this is one that I've really mostly seen more in the enterprise, you know, this is more an issue that, like, say, Microsoft has in startups, startups tend to be awesome, but it's like understanding that when something doesn't go right, you know, something goes wrong, taking a minute to think, what kind of a failure is this? It's like sometimes, you know, fail failures happen because, you know, there's something about our process that isn't working, but sometimes, you know, shit just happens. We all, you know, going back to the thing I said earlier, we all write bugs. We encounter libraries that have bugs in them. Customer requirements change. Sometimes things just happen, they don't go right, and that's just life as being a developer. It's something that just happens, and there's nothing that needs to be changed to fix it, right? We're always, there's always gonna be bugs. So we say, oh, we had, you know, five bugs this last sprint. Well, okay, that can be considered a mistake, but they happen, and there's nothing that can be done to eliminate them. 
But there's other things that you know, absolutely can be fixed. Uh, for example, let's just say that the meeting time for your stand-up isn't working for a lot of people uh, because maybe you've got some parents with kids. And so like, that's, a, and if people are constantly missing stand-ups because you know, they're having to get their kids to school, okay, yeah, missing stand-ups is an issue and that can hurt the quality of the team. But that is an issue with the process and that means you need to change something. Uh, it could also be, for example, uh, for your pull request policy. Maybe you say that two people have to review every single PR but it turns out that that's a little too burdensome and it's, you know, PRs are lagging. And by the way, PRs are totally a part of the Agile process, I think. And I would consider that something, a part of a process that is open to change. So you might say like, okay, it sounds great in theory to have, you know, two people review each PR, but in practice, it's meaning that we end up with this huge backlog of PRs that aren't getting landed at the end of the sprint. So maybe we need to change that to one. So like that is an example of, the, of a, a process change that actually can improve. So whenever in, you encounter an issue, whenever something doesn't go right, it's really useful to take some time to figure out what, which of these two buckets that problem falls into. Because once you figure that out, then you know what you need to do about it, if anything. All right, and the next uh, uh, like tip that I have is to, kind of like I've been saying, it's a meta one, is resist trying to prevent all the bad. You know, we, we tend to have the, this habit, you know, we're engineers, you know, I'm, I'm certainly like this, you know, when I see a problem, I immediately go into fix it mode. I'm like, oh, problem happened, how do we fix it? That's, that's sort of where my brain just goes. And I think a lot of us are like that. But sometimes we need to resist that temptation, because, you know, like I said, bugs happen. And sometimes just because something didn't go optimally doesn't mean that we should immediately be, be jumping in tra and trying to fix it. You know, there's, uh, for example, there's, uh, we might thinking, oh, we can automate some of this away to prevent it from happening. But, you know, hopefully we've all seen that XKCD comic that talks about creating a tool to automate things and then all of a sudden that's your life is maintaining that tool and not doing your work. Like, so we want to really evaluate, is there something that we should be doing, should we put in effort, you know, time and effort to fix a problem that doesn't need that time and effort to automate it away or fix it with process. You know, it's just a thing that happens. And so we really just want to discern that. And whenever we're like, oh, I should write a tool to do this, or oh, we should tweak the process to do this, you know, your first thought should be like, well, do we really? You know, we always want to be a little self-critical of those feelings. And it just, because part of that is, you know, we need to allow room for people to be people. Because like, as the Agile Manifesto says, you know, we value people over process. You know, this is one of the four values in the Agile Manifesto, and it's there for a reason. And I think it's the most important one, is that like, process is a tool to help us do work. It is not you know, some law that we all have to abide by that is unchangeable. You know, they're, just, they're tools, and like any other tool, it can be changed to adapt to the people doing the work in the specific context. So if we can really just remember to keep people at the center of this, and not focus so much on tools and process, that's how we create teams that are more effective, that we work faster, we deliver quicker, and we deliver better quality. And with that, I wanna thank you all for listening.